Welcome to another episode of Geography Made Easy. Today we will be understanding the relief and the physiography of India. India is a very vast country which has a great diversity of relief features with a number of different types of physiography ranging from very tall mountains to deserts and plains, plateaus, coastal areas, as well as islands. We will try to understand about the different physiographic units which are present in India and how they influence the human beings living on this, in this country. India's physiographic diversity is due to its geology. The kind of rock which is existing in a particular place leads to the kind of different kind of physiographic features which we see in that particular area. For example, we have the Himalayan mountain ranges which has a very complex geology compared to the peninsular plateau which is made out of very old crystalline rocks. Based on this, India can be divided into five physiographic divisions. The Himalayan mountain ranges, the Great Plains of North India, the peninsular plateau, the coastal plains and the islands. In this map, we will see the broad divisions which are dividing into India into the five major parts. The first one is the Himalayan mountain ranges. Which is existing in this area. Then we have the northern plains which is existing in around this area. Then we have the peninsular plateau which is existing in this area as a division. Then we have the coastal plains. So we have the eastern and the western ghats on both the sides. And we have the coastal plains in the sides. And finally, we have the Andaman and Nicobar Islands in the Bay of Bengal and in the Arabian Sea respectively. So I can give them numbers. So this is my first physiographic division. This is my second physiographic division. This is my third physiographic division. This is my fourth physiographic division. And these are my fifth physiographic broad divisions. Now we will be dealing with each of the units separately. We will start with the Himalayan mountains. If we look at the south to north division of the Himalayas, the Himalayas can be divided into three divisions. The lowest division is called the Shiva Lakes or the lower Himalayas. So if you are driving from the plains or if you are riding a car or a train and you are driving from the plains towards the north, you are first going to encounter the Shivalik Himalayas or the lower Himalayas. The elevation of these Shivaliks are much lesser. As you rise, as you go beyond the Shivaliks lies the middle or the lesser Himalayas which have a greater height. And finally, you have the greater or the inner Himalayas or the Himadri range. This is a photo of the Himalayas. We will be starting with the Shivaliks. The length of the Shivalik is around 2400 kilometers in the east-west direction. It starts from around the Indus Valley in the west and ends uh, up, up to the Brahmaputra River in the east. The width of the ranges varies between 50 kilometers in Himachal Pradesh 
to just 15 kilometers in Arunachal Pradesh, where the width decreases. The height is varying from 900 to 1200 meters. The location of the Shivalik ranges is in this way. So it forms the foothills of the Himalayas and has the lowest height. This is the Shivalik ranges. We can see that it is lying just at the junction of the plains and the mountains. Next we have the middle or the lesser Himalayas. These hills are known as the Himachal or lower or lesser Himalayas. It ranges between 60 to 80 kilometers and it, its elevation varies between 3500 meters to 4500 meters above mean sea level. There are a few snow covered peaks in this range. A number of passes are present here. Passes are areas between two mountain ranges through which one can walk from one part to the other. They are comparatively flattish in nature and they have always played a very important role when people have traveled from beyond the Himalayan ranges and were coming to the plains. Many of the trade routes are located along the passes. So some of the passes which are located here are Banihal Pass, Pir Panchal, Vidir and Golabghar. Very interestingly, there are many of the very beautiful Himalayan hill resorts or Himalayan retreats which are located in this range. It also has longitudinal flattish valleys known as dunes located in this range. Some of the very famous hill resorts are the Shimla, Musori, Ranikhet, Almora, Darjeeling and many more. Let us look see the location of the Middle Himalayas. The Middle Himalayas are located in this manner. This is a photo of the Kanchenjunga from Darjeeling, which is a hill resort in the eastern Himalayas in the state of West Bengal. We have many similar beautiful hill resorts which are neither too cold because of its height and also they have very beautiful views because the snow-capped mountains of the north can be seen from these places. Next we have the inner or the greater Himalayas also known as the Himadri. Now they are the tallest Himalayan ranges and that is why they are known as the snow covered peaks or the Himadri range. The average height of this mountain is greater than 6000 meters and the width is around 25 kilometers. Many of the most important peaks including the highest mountain peaks in the world are located in this range. We have the Mount Everest whose height is 8850 meters, Kanchenjunga 8598, Makalu 8481 meters, Dhalagiri 8172 meters and Nanga Parbat 8126 meters. We will see how it is located. It is located in this manner around the Himalayas. Of course, I am showing the ranges for simplicity as simple lines, but they are not simple lines. Rather, they are a series of mountains which have width. Some of the most important peaks which are located 
uh, in this range are the Kanchanjunga, we have uh, Mount Everest, we have Nanda Devi, These can be very importantly asked in the examination from map point. So please just not, uh, please just prepare yourselves for not only locating the mountain ranges but also with the location of some of the highest peaks of the world. This is the snow covered peaks from the Imadri ranges. Now we have certain offshoots of the Himalayas which lay beyond or uh, the Himalayan mountain ridges and ranges. So we have the northwest offshoots which lie beyond the Indus and we have the northeast offshoots where we have mountains lying beyond the Brahmaputra. So we have the Hazara Suleiman in the west and we have the Arakan Yuma in the east. These are, this is a photo of some of these offshoot mountains or the Trans Himalayas. Just like the North South Division, Himalayas can also be divided into the Eastern and the Western Divisions. According to the East to West Division, Himalayas can be divided into four different parts. The Kashmir or the Punjab Himalayas. Then we have the Himachal Uttarakhand or Kumaon Himayal Himalayas. Then we have the Nepal Himalayas. And finally in the east we have the Assam Himalayas. The four divisions are the Punjab Himalayas in the north. Then we have the Kumaon Himalayas. Then we have the Nepal Himalayas. And finally, we have the Assam Himalayas. So, in four different divisions, we can divide the Himalayas into four parts. Now, we will look at the difference between the Eastern and the Western Himalayas. This can come as a two mark question within a five mark question or question it can come as a component of a larger bigger question so the location of the eastern and the western himalayas are different for the eastern himalayas it lies east of 88 degrees east longitude for western himalayas it lies west of 86 degree east longitude if we have to demarcate this with the help of rivers the Western Himalayas lies between the Indus and the Kali, Kali River. The Eastern Himalayas lies between the Tista and Brahmaputra River. The Western Himalayas, usually we see it rise gradually. So the Shivalik ranges, the Himachal ranges and the Himatri ranges are much more extensive. On the other hand, the eastern Himalayas rise abruptly from the plain. So if you are traveling from Bihar or West Bengal, we will be able to see the peaks of Kanchanjunga very clearly from the plains, which does not happen in case of the western Himalayas because with the Shivalik and the other ranges are much more extensive. So the very high Himadri ranges are not visible. The average annual rainfall is less than 100 centimeters in case of Western Himalayas. Western Himalayas are much more drier. The average annual rainfall is more than 200 centimeters in case of Eastern Himalayas. They are much more wetter. This leads to a difference in the flora and fauna which we see between the Eastern and the Western Himalayas. The Western Himalayas have vegetation which are alpine and coniferous in nature and to some extent also xerophytic in nature. 
and on the other hand the eastern tracts are covered by very dense vegetation evergreen rainforests and we see that some of the very thick dense forests are located in the eastern himalayan ranges now from the examination point of view we have seen that questions can come where a cross section can be drawn from the north to the south with some of the different features marked as a b c d and they have to be identified so this is a iac question which had come a few years back so we have from south to north a cross section and here the ganga plains and the kundun mountains have been were written and these were marked as a b c d so on and so forth so we have the shivalik ranges which comes just after the ganga plains if you look towards the north then we have the dunes or the longitudinal valleys which lie between the shivaliks and the middle himalayas then follows the middle himalayas and finally we have the very high ranges of the himadri then beyond that we have a flattish area we have the trans himalayas and then we have a flattish uh, uh, flattish area which is the tibetan plateau and then we have the mountains of the central asian plains similarly questions from this type have also come we are going to do this in more details when we do the indus ganga brahmaputra plains so a cross section has been drawn from north to south cutting across the himalayas across the northern plains up to the peninsular plateau so the peninsular plateau and the himadri range were marked we have to mark the himachal shivalik range and different parts of the uh, of the plains so uh we have different components of the alluvium which we will be dealing with much more in details in the next slides so i think this question these type of questions are very important and when one is doing this chapter they need to be very very careful about the location of different uh physiographic units uh within a larger or a smaller unit they need to know the location they need to know how they look so this is going to help you if you have this knowledge because this kind of questions have come time and again for iisc next we uh, we end this uh, particular uh, aspect or component with the significance of the himalayas the himalayas have played a very important role in the life of human beings uh, across the indian subcontinent from regulating the climate to uh, to uh, the origin of some of the greatest rivers uh, which are carrying alluvium and making the uh, plain area so fertile we have the the fertile soils it has acted the himalayas has acted as a as a defense mechanism uh, and preventing a lot of invasion to take place from the northern plains it has forest agricultural wealth it has it caters to tourism pilgrimage and it is also a storehouse of lot of minerals which is still being exploited in the himalayas next we will start with the indus ganga brahmaputra plains this plain lies just south of the himalayas and they are said to be deposited from alluvium which has been carried by rivers from the himalayas so formed by deposition of rivers from indus ganga brahmaputra and many other tributaries and sub tributaries of these major rivers the east west direction of the indus ganga brahmaputra plain is 2400 km from satluj to ganga the plains are the widest at ilhabad or prayagraj or at around 280 km and it is in it is the narrowest in assam where it varies between 90 to 100 km the plains as i have already explained have formed uh, by infilling of sediments which have been brought by the himalayan rivers now we will look at uh, the location of the of the plains the northern plains are located in this part and here also we have plains and even this portion is considered to be part of the northern plain this is the assam valley 
this is uh, Assam Brahmaputra Valley and we have the Ganga which is one of the major rivers and its tributaries flowing from the Himalayas and depositing its material here and we have the dry part of the plain which is in the Thar desert area. This is one photo of the northern plains as it flows across uh, vast areas. So once we are trying to understand uh, though a plain means a vast featureless area we have to understand that it is not so and there are many other smaller features which are seen within the plain. We have the Bhabar, the Tarai, the Bhangar, the Khadar, the Bhur, the Barind and the Barkhan. The Bhabar and the Tarai are basically features which correspond to alluvial fans. So Bhabars are porous pebble studded rocks which are the fan surfaces and south of the fan surfaces we have the Tarai region where we have the where the water which, uh, which uh, was flowing under the porous uh, rocks of the Bhabar emerge and form alluvium and it is marshy. The river terraces are where we see uh, older alluvium which are called the Bhangar and the newer alluvium where, which every year get replenished is found on the flood plains is known as the Khadar. We have elevated land in the Ganga Yamuna Doab which is known as the Bhur and we have some old plains of uh, the Indus Ganga Brahmaputra plain which is uh, which is old dissected plains which still exist uh, where some remnants of scrubs and forests remain but obviously most of it has been reclaimed by agriculture. They are called Barind in certain parts of India. In the desert area, in the third desert area of the plain, we see Barkhans which are the crescent shaped sand dunes found in the Rajasthan desert. Now we will be just looking at some of the diagrams of the features we have been discussing in the previous slide. So we talked of the Barkhan which is crescent stick shaped sand dunes which looked something like this. Barkhans usually have uh, two uh, tails which are called the horns and they have some height and they are formed when the sand is plentiful in number and they are seen in certain parts of the Rajasthan plains. Apart from that we have been talking about the Bhabar and the Tarai. So if this is the Himalayas this is the cross-sectional view. The rivers are flowing from here and they are depositing the material here. So these are the pebbly material which get deposited at the base of the alluvial fan. This is called my bhabar. And because the water here uh, the deposition is pebbly, the water is seeping down and flowing below the bhabar. It is emerging in this part and this portion is usually we see it becomes swampy and water logging takes place. This is known as my tarai. So these are the local names given for alluvial fan and the area which lies beyond the alluvial fan as the bhabar and the tarai. We have also talked of the older and the younger alluvium which is the Bhangar and the Khadar. So I will just uh, with the help of two diagrams I will just try and explain. So we have certain elevated areas. The river has eroded and widened its, va its valley. Now this is the present valley. So this portion, these are the portions where we see that alluvium has had been deposited and now they are forming alluvial terraces. They have a little bit higher elevation. The river once used to flow in this way. This used to be the land and as we have seen that with time the river has eroded and created a 
wider valley now this is the present path of the river where we see that the river is flowing in this area and some portions of the older valley remain as we were terrace terraces or ele elevated lands these are known as my bhangar the khadar is the yearly part of the plain which is getting inundated or flooded every year this is known as my khadar so these features have been explained and they are very important because differences between bhabar and tarai and bhangar and khadar can be asked as a two or three mark question in the exam where we have to remember two to three points at least when we are writing out the differences so bhabar is uh, seen at the foot of the shiva lakes and uh, tarai is seen at the foot of the bhabar bhabar is usually we see it is uh, the width is less than the tarai area it is pebble studded rocks and tarai is made out of finer alluvium i think this is a very important point and this should be written so streams are disappearing in the bhabar area because of the porosity and streams are emerging in the tarai area and uh, they are creating marshy area again a very important point which i think needs to be mentioned here and uh, bhabar is not very suitable because the drainage is uh, is absent on the surface so bhabar is not very uh, suitable for agriculture on the other hand the tarai is quite suitable for agricultural proper, uh, purposes then we have differences between bhangar and khadar the older and the younger alluvium so bhangar is older alluvium khadar is younger alluvium uh bhangar is above the level of the flood plains and does not get inundated every year whereas khadar is getting replenished each and every year sometimes we see within bhangar there are certain calcium depositions called kankar or kankar khadar on the other hand we see is very clayey and fine silt it is bhangar is not that uh, suitable for agriculture because uh it is old alluvium it is not getting replenished the soil is not uh, getting replenished every year the nutrients are not getting replenished on the other hand khadar on the khadar intensive agriculture can be practiced and uh, bhangar is called dhaya it is a local name it is called dhaya in punjab khadar is called bet in punjab so these are two local names which have also been mentioned in the book so uh, if we look at the regional divisions uh, and we just we'll just brief it up in a small manner so we have the first regional division of the northern plain which is the rajasthan plain or the great indian desert which is very important because we have already discussed a feature from the plains the rajasthan plains so it is a low lying area of stony waste interrupted by sand dunes and wedges in certain parts of the plain so not the entire plain is covered by thick sand it is only in certain parts that sand dunes occur the average elevation is 325 meters and we see that the aravallis are part of this rajasthan plain and they form quite a lot of height um, it receives rainfall which does not exceed 25 cm so drainage is uh, we do not see much drainage development in this area one of the most important rivers seen here is the luni river and it also contains certain saline lakes in certain parts next we have the punjab haryana plain uh formed by alluvial deposits of basically five rivers which make up doabs doabs are land between two rivers so we have the bist jalandhar doab the bari doab the rechna doab the chaj doab and the sind sagar doab so this is important for map pointing and should be taken uh, proper care of when practicing for this chapter so the rivers draining uh, have khadar bluffs so called dhaya which we have already discussed and the streams flowing along the plains are called chors so this is a photo of 
uh, the uh, the Rajasthan plains as I have said it is not very very dry and agriculture is also being practiced in certain parts of the Rajasthan plain so all the, of the plain is not dry and barren and desert desert like as we expect it this is uh, a photo of the Punjab plains where intensive agriculture takes place and we know that this is the part where green revolution had taken place and there are lots of wheat fields in this part of the northern plains. Next we have the Ganga plain, one of the most important plains and the Ganga plain is divided into three parts which is the upper, middle and the lower Ganga plains. The alluvial deposit in the Ganga plain is very very thick ranging from 1000 to 2000 meters. Doabs are present with coals uh, which are intervening slopes dividing the doabs. Then we have uh, uh, in the middle Ganga plains we have Bhurs and lower plains we see delta and uh, fine silt seen in the lower part of the plains. So this is uh, the Ganga near Haridwar where it is just entering the plain area. So what is the significance of the plains? It is very very significant as the northern Indian plains are known as the granaries, granary of India. And most of the agricultural activities which feeds the entire population of the country takes place in this part. And uh, apart from that, density of population is very high in the northern plains. And uh, we see that development of large cities Civilizations, trade, commerce, etc. has taken part in this plane a lot. Next, we move on to the third most important uh, physiographic unit of the Indian subcontinent, which is the peninsular plateau. So, the peninsular plateau is shaped in the form of an irregular triangle. It is one of the oldest landmass of India, or as we have already discussed in the previous video, where we have seen that how or what is the geology of the landmass of peninsular plateau the average elevation is uh, ranging between 600 to 900 meters and it is surrounded the plateau is surrounded by hills on all three sides the north south distance of the plateau is 1600 kilometers and the east-west direction is 1400 kilometers. Of course, it tapers down as we move towards the south. So, if I have to roughly draw, the peninsular plateau is more or less lying in this part. So, this is my east-west direction. And this is my north-south direction which is around 1600 kilometers and this is around 1400 kilometers. This is a photo of one part of the Deccan Plateau. Now the peninsular plateau, the Deccan Plateau is divided into many different parts. We have the Malwa Plateau, the Deccan Plateau and the Chota Nagpur Plateau. The Malwa Plateau, it lies in the northwest of the Narmada and Tapi rivers. Uh, it is composed of hard rock and it has some of the badland formations seen here. So, one of the most important badlands of India for which it is notorious is the Chambal Valley. The Chambal and the Betwa rivers are flowing in the northeast direction from here, forming ravines and gullies which are known as the badlands. And if you have watched Shole, you would know what I am talking about. So, Gabbar Singh uh, lived in the, in the fictional part of course was of Chambal Valleys. But uh, Chambal is notorious for its decoids. And Fulan Devi is one such decoid who, should, who used to live in Chambal and operate uh, within the badland area. So the it formed a natural hiding place for the 
for the people to hide, for the decoys to hide. And also this area is economically a weaker part of India. So we see that that is also another reason why a lot of the decoys originated in this area. The northwestern part of the plateau is occupied by the Aravalli and Old Fold Mountain. Next we have the Deccan Plateau. It is a triangular plateau lying south of Tapi River and bounded by Satpura and Vindhya ranges. So um, we have the eastern and western ghats in the eastern and western side. The slope is from west to east. And finally, we have the Chota Nagpur Plateau, which is a northeast projection of the peninsular plateau, where we see that it is occupying states of Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Purulia districts of West Bengal. It is made up of Gondwana rocks, Arkean granites and Deccan lavas. And uh, it is drained by several streams and rivers. And it forms spectacular landscapes with a lot of rejuvenated uh, streams, waterfalls, which are seen in this uh, particular plateau area. This is one photo of the Chota Nagpur plateau. So I do not want to go into more details with of the plateaus. So uh, I think this much should be enough for the questions which might be asked. One needs to be careful about the map pointing parts uh, or questions which can come from this chapter. Next we have the western and the eastern ghats. Very uh, briefly I will just discuss the western and the eastern ghats. The western ghat is the western boundary of the Deccan plateau. It is around 1600 kilometers long and broken at certain gaps or passes. The passes are used by railways. So it is a continuous mountain area, mountain range seen in the western part of the Deccan plateau. And uh, we only see certain gaps or passes through which usually we see that the railway lines have been built across these passes. And we have the Eastern Ghats, but uh, the Eastern Ghats are more dissected. They are occurring on the eastern part of the Deccan Plateau uh, near the eastern coast. They are, uh, most of the peninsula rivers are flowing from west to east and are entering the Bay of Bengal. So, dissecting the Eastern Ghats. So, the Eastern Ghat is dissected and eroded and we don't have uh, a continuous ridge-like structure as we see in case of Western Ghats. The eastern and the western ghats are merging in the south at the Nilgiri hills. So I will just quickly draw a diagram. So this is the location of my western ghats and this is the way in which my eastern ghats are located and they join here. This is my Nilgiris. Again, map pointing can come from this chapter. So it is very important that we practice the location of all the mountain regions, mountain ranges, uh, physiographic division, uh, divisions within the map. This is a photo of the Western Ghats during the monsoons. The coastal plains are narrow strip of lands which lie on both sides of the Western and the Eastern Ghats. Between the Western Ghats and the Arabian Sea, we have the West Coastal Plain. And between the Eastern Ghats and the Bay of Bengal, we have the East Coastal Plain. These narrow strip of lands have, uh, are known by many names. The West Coastal Plain, the Konkan, Kannad and Malabar Plain is the names given uh, to the plains lying between Gujarat and Maharashtra. And on the other hand, the Malabar Plain is the plains when it lies in Kerala. The Malabar Plains has lagoons and backwaters and the Konkan coast usually has estuaries. On the other hand, the eastern coastal plain has the North Sirkat Plain, the Coromandel or the Carnatic Plain. So it has two divisions. The southern part is the Coromandel Plain. It is wider 
in comparison to its western counterpart and deltas are present with mangrove forests in many cases in the on at the mouth of the rivers also lagoons are seen in certain places so we have the eastern coastal plain here and the western coastal plain here this is a diagram of the western coastal plain finally we come to the islands we have two sets of islands the luxury islands which are coral islands present in the arabian sea and the andaman and nicobar islands which are a volcanic island cluster present in the bay of bengal they are more in number than the luxury islands the andaman and nicobar islands has volcanic uh, volcanic uh, eruptions also the presence of mud volcanoes are seen here and we have a dormant volcano present in the andaman and nicobar islands the barren island volcano so this is the area where the andaman and nicobar islands are located and the lakshadweep or islands are located here This is a photograph of the Lakshadweep Islands. The important questions from this chapter, from the examination point of view, are the various features, descriptions of the various features. For example, what is a doa? What is toes? What is barin? What is bhuj? What is uh, the different features have to be explained and the reasons why they are formed and where they are seen. These things one needs to know. and differences for example khadar and bhangar uh, eastern and western himalayas andaman islands lakshadweep islands west coast plain eastern coastal plain these type of questions are important from this chapter so one needs to prepare those things properly map pointing is very very important from this chapter and every year questions from the map have come and one needs to be very careful when one is preparing this chapter and they need to do the map pointing thoroughly identification of features from schematic diagrams as i show i as i have shown in uh, some previous slides that needs to be practiced uh, this has come in the previous years also so once when one is studying this chapter we need to keep in mind that we have to practice about the location of each feature where they are located or if we have a cross sectional diagram as to what is what comes after what that needs to be understood so the examiner is looking for not just marking up the chapter but what kind of geographical understanding has developed uh, for the candidate when they are evaluating their answer script so if one knows that uh, the shivalik is the lowest hill one will very easily be able to locate that so it is very interlinked with the geology chapter and uh, one needs to go through these things over and over again and if there are any doubts and questions from this chapter please feel free to leave a comment in the chat section i will come back with another video trying to answer your questions and uh, If you like this video please uh, subscribe and share this with your friends if you are finding this useful and uh, thank you very much and i hope to see you in the next video